I'd hear her in your room, on her knees, by your, by your bed, crying in her prayers. God protect you, bring you home safe. And that's things that were the pain of a mother, you know, that goes when her sons are over there. My name is Joshua Gallegos. Um, I'm a graduate of El Rancho High School, class of 1966. I've been a resident of Pico Rivera since 1962. And so I guess Pico Rivera was, most of my life has been here and I'm still living in Pico Rivera to this day. Um, I uh, also attended Rio Hondo College at the time and, and um, during the Vietnam years, um, I enlisted in the United States Navy uh, in 1968 and all the way to um, 1972 active duty and then in 74 with the reserve time. Made three deployments to Vietnam, 68, 69, 71 to 72. Um, they were I guess wartime, uh, heavy memories of that of that time that was going on. Um, I'll always remember the guys, my friends that were over there, that and my teammates that didn't make it back. And I'm speaking of, for example, of Jesse Chavez, who was very close to me, and uh, Sam Favada, another teammate, Tim Nunley, uh, James Boda, John Stalter. Richard Whiting, some of the guys that played football with at El Rancho and, and uh, that didn't make it back to forever will ever be enshrined in the hall, on the wall rather. And um, uh, the saying that forever, forever in your hearts. Um, the, the wall is coming back to Pico Rivera. So when it does come, it's going to bring the memories back. There'll, there'll be a, a lot of pain for a lot of people, but a lot of things have been said, but I believe it is necessary so that we pass on this and bequeath this to our sons and daughters and to our grandchildren, that they don't forget the sacrifices that these guys made and served. When we went over there, we didn't know if we were coming back or not. You know, you went over there and did your job, and that's what you did. You had to do it. And uh, regardless, as I mentioned, all branches were over there. They were all doing their bit for the same cause, for the common cause. Uh, politically, we didn't have anything to say about it. We just did our job. It is not the job of the military to dictate politics in the making of war only the fighting of them. And that was what, where we felt. We didn't have one pain or the other. Just get the job done and get home. Unfortunately, over 58,000 boys didn't come home. So I guess people always tell me, well, you're one of the lucky ones. I said, well, I don't know if it's luck. I just call them I'm more of a blessing. I got blessed, you know, to make it back and come back home. But that doesn't mean that we don't have, uh, you know, problems at times. But all I can say is, well, I'm here, and thank God, and to this day I still say, God bless America. Coming by, I went by, I came by Rancho High School, my alma mater, and I remember that, um, on our graduation at Friday, the ceremony. And when the graduation ceremony was over, they told us, you know, time to go get in the buses and go to the Disneyland all night party. So as front row get up, walk out, and they walked out. Next row, stand up, walk out. And as the guys were going by, we we're all high-fiving, and we we're all saying to each other, see you in Vietnam, see you in Vietnam, see you in Vietnam, see you in Vietnam, because we were all, you know, the war was in Tay Day and everybody was going. And we all knew that we our time was coming close. It was uh, just a matter of time. 
because some of the guys already being drafted and going to the war was getting escalating higher and higher. So that's what we thought there. And so anyhow, um, myself, I um, there was no way out of it. I guess uh, we knew we were going to serve. And every guy at that time uh, was required to register at 18 years of age. It was mandatory. There were draft boards back then. They're no longer there. There was no lottery system. It was, you're 19 year old, you're gone, basically. And uh, uh, all the branches were over there. I mean, every Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Coast Guard was there. They were there also, saw them, the Coasties. So everybody's over there. And uh, uh, myself, I, uh, I was a little boy. I wanted to be a sailor, you know. And uh, I know the Cubs called went to the Long Beach Naval Shipyard, open house, went on board an aircraft carrier and saw the whole thing. I thought it was odd by it, you know. And, and during the 50s, you know, as a kid, you saw the war movies, the patriotic things, you know, and, and all. And so it, it influenced you. And of course, I had uh, my father uh, back in the 1930s had served. I, and uh, my uncle, his brother, was killed in, in the Pacific, you know. so. Uh, he was our family hero, and so we had other people that served in Korea. But growing up, I said, well, when it, the push came, I said, well, you know what? Either they draft me, go into the Army, or I join the Navy, because I always wanted to be a sailor anyway, join the Navy. So I have to serve. I have to serve, so face it. So I went ahead and enlisted in the Navy. And um, the next thing you know, well, we're in basic training, and. And uh, what, a, what a wake up call that was. Oh boy. Uh, everything like it. Uh, standing there and DI shouting in your ear like that and the whole thing and, and uh, the drilling and, and things. But the funny thing uh, I remember in basic training is that uh, we got lectured a lot by different guys, and I remember that. We fill out insurance forms, and the DI told us, he says, make sure you fill out your insurance forms. It's a $10,000 insurance policy on you in case you get killed and come back. They were looking at each other, and he goes, we're, we're the, and these bleachers, you know, all sitting on, four or five companies all sitting there filling paperwork. We elect a guy in a loudspeaker up there on a podium. And he looks up there and says, well, I can tell you right now, fill out your paperwork, because a good number of you, I'm sorry, will not be coming back. So it's like, then the reality hit, you know, like, oh, uh, we're dealing with a life and death situation here. Because right now it's just basic, but then it, it got us ready for what was going over there. And, and, and it was, and, you know, it, each, each, each branch did its job. I mean, uh, all, all, for, um, all for the cause, you know, we're all over there. I ran into guys over there. It was funny because I got the guys, uh, I went to guys from Rancho High School, were over there walking around in ports overseas. Ajax! Hey, what are you, do what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And the whole thing like that, high five. And, uh, one night I was standing short patrol and I ran into one of my teammates from El Rancho Football, P. Arianas. He goes, Ajax! And that was my nickname, Ajax, back then. Hey, PD, and you know, how you doing? We're all over here and like that. I ran into David, uh, David Salcido over there and all these different dudes. And it's like Pico Rivera is all over there, <laughs> you know. And uh, there's certain different places, but uh, it, was, it was something. We, um, uh, on the horrible morning of February the 14th, uh, will always be with me. That, you know, we lost uh, we lost 29 sailors that day, four pilots, and uh, 85 guys so critically injured had to be flown off of there when uh, bombs are going off of the flight deck and things that nature. I served on the USS Enterprise. And it's a very, very famous uh, explosion, explosions and fire scene that it had back in the 14th of January. It, it really freaked out a lot of guys, you know. They were horrible, you know. See, that people have no idea what ordinance does to the human body. It just takes it apart. And these are things that, that stay with you. We came back. I was there in 68, 69, back in 71, 72. And, um, um, you know, so many things you remember in, in, in doing your job and things and battle drills and whatever. And, but the one that scared me the most, I think, would have to have been 69. We got back in 69, and we've been gone for, oh, God, almost nine months. And it was, um, it was our first day back. And we're so happy uh, back in the States. 
my first day back, and I remember when I was here before, I went to San Francisco, and, and, and I told the guys, there's a place in Frisco called a Cable Car Steakhouse. Great steak, garlic bread, you know, potato beer. You guys have the beer you want, but I didn't drink, but they did, so okay. So a couple of us, three of us went down there. And we were not expecting, you know, I mean, we, before we went there, we were, we were in Berkeley, and uh, the ship was home port in Alameda, which is in the East Bay, near, you know, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda. The, so we were over there, and we went over to Berkeley, we wanted to go see the campus. Well, we go to the campus, you know, and we remember, I remember we bought the oatmeal cookies at the little cook, cookie shop across the street, and the entrance to Berkeley is an arch, and there's a, a mound hill. That's where I'm gonna go over there, see the campus. And all these, there must have been about, I don't know, 20 or 30 of these uh, hippie types out there, and they all got up, they walked, they saw us, and they started cussing at us. Don't even left, come over here, man, get the F out of here, you bunch of fascists, you bunch of, and we're just like, what the heck do we do? You know, we're in our, our, blue, our blues, our dress blues, and, and they're cussing at us and flipping us off and telling us all kinds of stuff and, and calling us all kinds, insulting us. So one of the guys that I was with says, hey, let's go kick some hippie ass. And I said, no. We were told not to engage them. Remember, they said, a lot of speakers before we left the ship, do not engage, you will encounter protesters, do not engage them. You know, it wind up in the brig, you know, so we're fine. So we didn't go. That's when the next day I said, let's go to Frisco to get the stable car steakhouse. So, we took the bus across the Bay Area, and we went into uh, uh, the bus depot. And there they were, a whole bunch of them with their anti-war signs and all this kind of stuff. And you know, and then they, they were, they came over, it was upper deck, they came over, leaned over the rail at us, and they started flipping us off, cussing at us, calling us murderous fascists. Uh, you know, why, did, why it should have been us that died over there, not them. You know, there were just, every kind of insult you can think of, they were just letting us have it. And we just, God, let's just go back, you know. So then we got eight, we ignored them, went uh, they were all over the place, and it was night, we started coming back. And as we went to the bus depot, going back to the deck to get the buses back across the Oakland Bridge, back to Oakland, there was a bunch of them there. So, they're up there saying all this stuff. And I said, this is a different bunch, right? I said, what are you guys, working shifts? You know, <laughs> they said, F you and all this and that, whatever, and all. We were walking back. Well, anyway, this is our home greeting, our home welcoming we got back in 69 from that. I said, there's protests going on today, and the protesting doesn't stop, you know. So we got back and um, got to back to the ship, and we were relaxing. And then my mates get around me and they go, Goose, that was my nickname in the Navy, Goose. They said, Goose, they look by what? Oh shit, they're all behind me, what? And they said, you're, you're a jumper, man, what? So, so I took off my jumper right at that. And on my flap in the back was a couple of big dried hawkers where they spit on me. Big old, you know, <laughs> and um, it kind of leaves a, kind of like a hurt feeling, you know? After, uh, you know, you serve your country and you, you go over there and risk your life. And then you, you, you come back and, and you get spit on. And, It, uh, it kind of is a hurt that doesn't go away. And, uh, yeah, like I said, every, every branch was over there doing it. We did our job. And um, our job was support the, support the uh, ground boys. And we went up north, way up north, and we hit the North Vietnamese. We started bombing them. And um, uh, my ship uh, uh, um, was awarded the Red E. It's a little, it's an E that goes on the, one of the ship's ribbons. And every guy on the crew gets a, a Red E patch to put on the side of his peacoat or uniform. 
And we call it the bloody E, but of course, the white E means your ship went beyond efficiency, it's efficient. The red E means you go beyond efficiency, do your job. And uh, when those, those protesters saw the red E's on our uniforms, they said, well, you guys are real killing and killing people like that. Um, so they, uh, um, basically it just means you're, <laughs> it basically means that you should kill more people than anybody else. You know, we were launching sorties. We went one day of 67 straight days at sea, bombing the north, and bombing them, loading them up, bombing them, bombing them, and, and, and hitting that. We went south and we started launching uh, to support our, our Marines in the northern part of South Vietnam in the High Corps. And this is back in the 60s, 69, and 68 and 69 during the Tet Offensive. And so, um, these are the things that we, that, that, that we, that we did. Um, and so, I had lost friends over there. Jesse Chavez was very close to me. Teammates at Orion, so Tim Nunley, um, Don Stalter, Sam Favada, these guys, and uh, um, Jimmy Boda, uh, Ricky Wyden, these, these guys that we, uh, I was, heard they had, they had got it. And so uh, we didn't know if, if uh, you know, our time's gonna come or not. Like I said, some people, <laughs> when I was talking to one of the friend, a friend of mine who was in the Army, he said, oh, you were on a, you were on a, on a ship, you were safe at sea. Oh, you think so? Tell it to the 29 guys that died, by the four pilots and the 85 guys that were, you know, critical, you know, things of that nature, that there is no safe. <laughs> no matter where you're at, you, you risk it. They um, uh, told us at the induction center when I was first uh, reporting for my physical, they said that um, when you put on that uniform, you were gonna be in harm's way. Every guy, there were some guys that had it rougher than others, especially the, the land guys, the army guys, the armored marines, they, they were in the thick of it, really, you know. And uh, so, um, I don't know what, in some cases where we would talk about what was worse, well, we treated as worse. I mean, after the welcome we got in, in San Francisco, I said, I think the South Vietnamese people have more respect for us than our own, you know, peers out here that appreciate us more than these people, you know. And uh, these are some of the un, unheard things that you don't hear about, you know, uh, whatever. It was a terrible time for our country. Uh, the war was tearing the country apart. Politically, uh, well, you might say physically as well. Um, mothers are crying, uh, but people that you know they lost. Uh, Chuck, Chucky Stalter will tell you what his family went through, and Bobby Chavez will tell you what they went through, and, and uh, seeing these things. Uh, my my sister told me. Uh, when I sat down, I was sitting at the table with her. My mom and dad weren't there. And we were in some, and then she told me, you weren't here. What do you mean? After Jesse was killed, you know, and mom and dad went to his funeral, and she came back, and and, uh, and uh, you were over there, and I'd be here. I said, I'd hear her in your room, on her knees, by your bed, crying in her prayers. God protect you, bring you home safely. And that's things I remember, the pain of a mother, you know, that goes when her sons are over there. And uh, that morning on, on, on the flight deck, I came this close, this close to being blown to pieces. I had been up there and, and, and uh, we stopped over here by the superstructure, that's like the building flight deck. And I, we're looking at some things. We had to go to the back area. And then that little delay of a couple of minutes bought us time. Then we started to walk that way. And then a bunch of the bombs went off and things were horrible like that. So 
But if I hadn't stopped there, then I, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. <laughs> I don't think there'd been, been much of me left to, to, to bury, whatever, at that time. Um, it's different today. You know, it's, not, it's a different war now. My heart goes in respect, goes out to the people that are over there serving out in the Persian Gulf area and all that, as compared to what we had to go through, you know. Whole different ball game, different era. Um, every vet that sits here and talks is going to have to give you a different story, a different interpretation, different experience that they went through, and uh, uh, that nature. So it's um, something to remember and and, and 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 appreciate, as I can say. When the Vietnam Wall comes, I have nothing but respect for it, and uh, I feel like a part of me is there. Uh, I think for every guy that went over there and served, every guy that went over there and served and looks at that wall and looks there's a part of him there, you know, and his friends that are lost and are gone. Um, and um, somebody once said, for every young man that goes over there has lost a piece of his innocence that began over there and came home. And. Uh, People that have scarred uh, either physically or mentally or things of that nature, even at our age. Why do these things happen? Why do they come back? I don't know. I talked to the shrink over at Long Beach and he said it happens, you know, that they're going to come back and they're going to haunt you and you have to deal with them. I said, oh, no. yeah, I don't know about that. But I have never once regretted or been ashamed of serving my country. I still love my flag. I still salute it. I'm in a ball game or somewhere, and they say, stand up for the national anthem, remove your hats. And if I'm wearing a hat, I leave it on because I render a salute. Even without a hat, I will salute my flag to that day. That, that stays in me here. That's something that may... I remember my father, who was probably one of the most patriotic men I ever knew, you know, put into me and, and so on. And I, I have put that onto my sons, daughters, who are patriotic, and to my grandchildren. You know, uh, I have a 10-year-old grandson that that, um, that uh, is very patriotic, and he, he sees me salute the flag, and he salutes the flag, you know, and <laughs> he salute that. And so you know, it goes that way. You know, uh, it, 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 talking about it, it, it reminds me of that it must have been our, our first week in basic training. And we're all a bunch of the standing there and pictures, and this guy gets up there. He's a big uh, Navy guy up there, and a little stolid guy. He got up there, he's one of the DIs, and he says, um, Years from now, when you're sitting with your grandchild or granddaughter or grandson on your lap, if you can tell them with all the pride and confidence that you serve the world's most powerful, biggest Navy and serve for freedom. And uh, we look at each other like, okay, you know, it's a nod. And it, years later, those words that he said come back and I hold it. And I'm sitting in my lap and I'm laughing and my daughter, my wife goes, what's so funny? Because I got him over half of my granddaughter in my lap. And I go, this is what he said years ago. <laughs> she asked me, did I sure I just told her I was in the Navy? And I said, wow. It's like he knew it. It was going to happen, though. Know, there it is, like 40 years later, and his words come back to me and say, that, yeah, you know. Uh, I can't speak for other veterans, uh, how they feel or uh, regret or pride or sense. I only speak for myself. But those are the things that, that make up Joshua Gallegos, um, you know, and, and uh, after even you know, other years later, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to come back. I, Went to Rio Hondo College. I've been playing football there a year, and, and then uh, uh, went to UCLA. I just retired a couple of years ago from ninth faculty at Rio Hondo, teaching there at 40 years. And uh, I, I would say God's been good to me. You know, gave me a good life. I have my health. At 76 years old, I'm still going strong. You know, and, and working and and uh, and. Uh, it, I guess it was just to be, uh, believe, I believe in God and family and proud to be an American to this day and, you know. So I guess that sums it up, you know, at this point. My two, sh my two 
teammates at El Rancho and Rio Hondo. We played football our inaugural year in 66 at, our, at, at Rio Hondo College. We played at El Rancho and up there. Um, we're all serving at the same time. Sam and Jesse were in the Army. Sam Favada and Jesse Chavez. And there, I wrote an article for, and they printed it in the Winter Daily News, the PR profiler, the, uh, the El Rodeo newspaper at El, Ran at El Rancho, and even the um, El Paisano and Rio Hondo paper. And I mentioned them at a ceremony that we had up at Rio Hondo, but here's the coincidences that happened. Jesse and Sam both lived about a quarter of a mile from each other off Rosemead Boulevard. Aside from being teammates at El Rancho and Rio Hondo, they were both in the Army. And the sad thing about this, they died on the same day. On, I believe it's July the 21st or the 20th, somewhere along there, 1968. Um, the way it works is on the Vietnam Wall, your name is on there chronologically in the order in which you die. Their name, the, the, aside, they both came from Pico Rivera, both were teammates, football teammates, both on the Army, both on died the same day, and on the same wall, on the same portal, one name above the other. They're right, right there. There's, uh, Jesse and Sam are right here. They're both buried at Resurrection Cemetery on the same lawn, about 50 yards apart from each other. Still together, teammates to the end. And I remember, <laughs> I remember uh, talking in one of the ceremonies about them. And then I ended it by saying, If you're there at the cemetery at night and you listen very carefully, you might hear one of them say to the other one, as most army guys would to each other, and say, I, are you still there? Don't worry, I got your back. They're still there together. It's a little poetic, but yeah, that's how you see them. And those are the coincidences that those two Pico River boys, sons of Pico River, they wound up on the wall, they you know, the coincidences are just, I don't think you can find anybody else with that kind of coincidences that, you know, two boys from here and died the same day, same lawn, same wall, uh, you know, uh, just a few yards apart from each other. Every Memorial Day, since I've been back, I think only missed it once, I go to their grave sites, leave a flag, and, um, a single rose. And I haven't stopped doing it since, you know. And I guess I'll keep doing it this year, you know, I'll go up there again. Uh, they're still my, they're still my mates, still my uh, friends to this day. And so, uh, that's just again, once again, that's just the tradition of one, one Vietnam vet. We lost, we lost the last surviving member of the USS Arizona uh, a few weeks ago. The last one, he passed away of uh, the Pearl Harbor. And a lot more of the, of, I think very, a lot fewer Vietnam vets, that are, I mean, uh, World War II veterans that are left. You know, there were our heroes growing up as kids. Uh, Korean, the Korean vets are next, and they're pretty well up there in their years, behind their high 80s. And now, us Vietnam vet guys, we're, <laughs> we're the next guys, we're all in our, the, old, the next old guys, we're in our, all in our 70s now, you know, and, and um, uh, we get together in VFW post, things like that, which we, we do. And um, I guess we keep the guard going. Um, now the next batch of guys after us will be the uh, Persian Gulf War guys, you know, the Iraqi vets and uh, Kuwait in 1991 uh, from there and then Somalia. It seems to me that as long as our nation's been around, there's always a war to be fought here or there. One war here, one war there. There's always wars to be fought and always those guys are going to stand up and and do it, you know, they have to, to be, answer the call and go out and do it, and it's still going on today. Uh, without the military, um, we wouldn't go out of country. One thing I told my students at Rio Hondo, I would tell them, I would tell them, we're around today because of three reasons. One, 
a Christian Judeo form of government, which far exceeds any government in the world today. Two, we have always been strategically located by two vast oceans to keep our enemies in fear, Pacific Ocean that's helped us in every war we've had. And three, a powerful ready military at all times ready to go to do the job. And uh, that's what, you know, we all did our part. I, I told the guys at, a, at one of the speeches that we did, I did every, at uh, Memorial Day or Veterans Day here, here at, at the ceremony once I said, when you go on, when you go active and you're in the military, the guys that are ahead of you give you the baton, you take it, and now you stand the watch while your time that's there. And when your time's up, you take it and you pass the baton to those that come after you, and then they carry on the watch and protect our country and whatever. And so that's basically what's going on today. And, you know, uh, I can just say thank God for men and women that are willing to stand up and, and you know, be served for this country. I know some right now that are in there. Uh, uh, a friend of mine's daughter, she's serving on the USS Abraham Lincoln. His son is also in the army. He's in the army. He's over at, uh, at he's getting ready to deploy. He was going to go to, uh, they were going to send him to Iraq, but they just got to, they're going to Jordan now. They're going, the unit's going over there. And so he's got two serving, you know, two, got four kids, and two of them are, in the, are going in, are in right now. And so uh, that's what I mean. It goes on, it, the torch goes on, and, and, and uh, your time might be up, but it's going to go on, you know. And, and so that's rather, so my hat goes, anybody who serves, and, and I guess I might as well end with this old saying. And I think, according to President Reagan, he said, a lot of people go through life wondering if they ever made a difference. Well, those that wore the uniform and took the oath, don't. <laughs> young men are fighting halfway across the world, other young men and women, safe at home, openly advocate abandonment of Vietnam to communism. Perhaps they really don't know what this war is all about. In the words of a battle-weary young Marine, they would understand if they'd cross this 10,000 miles of ocean and live with us a day in Vietnam.